Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed theology. My name is Camden Busey. This is, I believe, episode 801, but now we're a little bit out of order because we recorded a couple of Van Til groups. So now we're a little bit out of sync in terms of episode numbers and when they were recorded and when they'll be released. But this, in terms of release date, should be, no, episode 802. See, I don't even know what I'm doing. Episode 802, and uh, I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, and delighted to be back uh, talking about the book of Acts today with none other than Adam York. Adam is pastor of Hope, OPC, in Grays Lake, Illinois. He serves on the session with me. Or I serve on the session with him. We mutually serve on the session together. Welcome, Adam. It's good to see you today. It's very good to be here, sir. Yeah, thanks for uh, driving on down. It's only, last I checked, 12 minutes, 12 maybe. minutes, eight <laughs> minutes. Depends on the traffic. Depends on what's going on on uh, Milwaukee Avenue or however you get here, Almond. Or as the almond farmers call it, Ammond. <laughs> uh, we're, we, it's fun. It's great to be nearby and uh, glad to be speaking today about some important things. So... Wasn't too long ago, you were preaching through the book of Acts at Hope OPC, and there was always a heavy emphasis on union with Christ, specifically in his sufferings, looking forward to union with Christ in his resurrection and glorification, of course. And we know that Christ intercedes for us now at uh, the Father's right hand, and uh, he's always working on our behalf. But there's some really interesting themes that you were drawing out in that whole series. How long did it take you to preach through Acts? A couple of years? That's a good question. I was, I think I was, as I was working through some uh, sermons, I think I was into the 70s, so that's over a year. Mm-hmm. So yeah, a year and a half maybe. Yeah, good stretch. Uh, but I, you know, it's it's wonderful when you're preaching through a book yourself, and then you start to learn and see various themes that are arising within the text. And uh, I always appreciated as you were dealing with uh, the Book of Acts how often uh, similar themes would arise. But we're seeing uh, specifically as as the Lord is recounting, you know by his inspiration, the history, and as Luke is writing this down, the history of the, of the saints and the churches as they're being established, etc. We're seeing uh, similar themes on how the Lord works among his people mm. and develops his disciples. And so this is also something that is beneficial to us. Uh, this isn't just history for the sake of reading about or learning what happened in the past, but history and uh, which is of benefit to see how the Lord worked with his people then and how he will continue to work with his people, though maybe not in as extraordinary ways. <laughs> we don't expect to be uh, killed by a mob and then <laughs> brought back from the dead, although the Lord could do that if he wants. But uh, I don't think we have a particular promise there uh, for that great. type of thing in the present day. So just in general, what's uh, what's been going on? People might want to catch up. And I don't always provide people with updates about what's going on at Hope, although I should. It's always on my mind. Uh, but how are things generally going for you? A Tennessee guy, uh, 20 years removed in Texas, now in Illinois. How are things at the church and at the presbytery level? And also give them a little update about what's going on with Pam, because I think people would really, really like to hear about that too. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So things are well, especially going well as we're coming out of winter in Illinois and going into spring and things are warming up and such a nice drive. I drove over with the window down today, which was the it's first time. <laughs> it felt great, though. <laughs> you know you're getting acclimated to Illinois with 63 to you feels great. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. So uh, going very well. Uh, recently started a new sermon series in the morning on the book of Genesis. So working through that, as you know, it goes very slowly, those first few chapters. They are chocked full of theology. And uh, concluded uh, not long ago a sermon series on the book of Ecclesiastes in the evening. So uh, first time ever I've preached catechetically. Uh, we're, I've started that up. And so I hope that that uh, serves the people very well. Uh, things are going well in the, the presbytery and more broadly, and uh, Pam continues to put up with me, so that's that's great. That's great news, and um, she is doing v very well in her music. We were just chatting a little bit about some AV stuff at home because when COVID hit, you know, she went in large measure to stream uh, because no one was doing live music, and thankfully she's doing live music again if you're in the Chicagoland area and want to hear some jazz, we can accommodate, or Milwaukee. Um, 
and uh, and so we've been just sort of hacking away, making improvements at the live stream abilities because uh, we got the ability to do that, and we continue. But she's uh, having a great time playing music. She just told me she's really quite booked up in May and June. So We use her music often for the theme music for many of our podcasts. So if you're ever wondering who's playing the various jazz renditions of different hymns, uh, or, you know, spiritual type songs, uh, that's coming from Pam. And Pam has got some great music that I think people would like to know about. One thing I would like people to, to take note of and perhaps subscribe is her YouTube channel. So now for the last couple of years, she's been broadcasting on most Saturdays from your house, a jazz brunch, bringing in various uh, musicians uh, to come and play for about, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes to an hour doing just a free concert that's broadcast on YouTube and people like Lane Tipton listen to it while they're working on their sermons. So can you tell us a bit about the YouTube channel and then maybe we can put in a plug for some of the other the uh, the other projects and albums that are coming out soon? Absolutely. Yeah, if you're a jazz aficionado um, or just a music aficionado, I'd encourage you to go check out uh, Pam's YouTube channel, just Pamela York. Um, uh, put that into the search and you should find it. Or I believe there's links from PamelaYork.com. And uh, yeah, Saturday mornings, that, that kind of started as there were not opportunities to go do live music soon after we moved here because of lockdowns. And uh, she sought to still play. And so we cobbled together stuff that was pretty bad to start with, with <laughs> webcams. It worked. It worked. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> oh, it was it was terrible, though. I think um, in COVID, everybody, all the churches and everybody started uh, stepping up their web, their live stream game, right? Yeah. Now yeah. there's a whole cottage industry of not only equipment, but also like YouTube channels and tutorials on how to get things yes, working. Yes. <laughs> there's so much available. In fact, we just got a new... Uh, a second camera and are trying to figure out how to do back and forth. And so that'll be coming soon to kind of give a little variety for people watching. Um, so yeah, tune into that. And then uh, she also has a group that she's started. Uh, she's part of called the Affinity Trio and uh, they play up in Milwaukee uh, very frequently uh, every Monday evening. In fact, if you want to go up there uh, at the Fister Hotel and mm. uh, and hear hear them, and then um, uh, they have a recording that should be coming out soon. We, yeah, we hope on all the channels, I presume. So yes. you can you know head on over to PamelaYork.com for information on uh, all the previous albums, and I'm sure when the new stuff comes out with the Affinity Trio, there'll at least be mention of that and links, uh, on, on the main website for that as well. But, it, you know, I'm on Spotify, Pam's on Spotify, uh, but you'll find her in other places, all the different venues that you're looking for stuff. So this is legit. This isn't like, uh, oh yeah, Adam's, Adam's wife, uh, does some music on the side and puts it on the internet. No, like she's, she's a legit excellent jazz pianist yes. putting out <laughs> professional records with world-class musicians. So <laughs> pretty much she wasn't married to me. She'd gone places by now. For sure. Well, you know, the Lord is merciful. His mercies are new every morning. Uh, great is this. Yeah, so. I should say even further. I would say, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I always want to put in uh, put in a plug for Pam and Pam's music, and um, you know, for Hope as well. Come on over to Hope Presbyterian Church, and on average, half the ser half the uh, Sundays, you're going to hear Pam playing the piano. Yeah. So you can't beat it. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so we're looking forward to uh, talking today and and following up with. Uh, some of this work on Acts. Uh, I was excited uh, for Adam, to you to come over, not just to hang out because it's good to have people by. Otherwise, Ryan and I kind of, we don't go crazy. We have a good time together, but it's nice to have some fresh blood in the building, you know, <laughs> lighten it up and and uh, we're happy to do that. But let's dive on into the material here in Acts, uh, looking at discipleship specifically as a theme. Uh, bring You know, introduce us here and let's get into the material. Sure. So, of course, you always feel ready to preach through a book after you're done. You get uh, a, I know. a much better sense of right. it. So I certainly grew through my study through Acts. Nevertheless, at the beginning, I, I had a sense that, um, you know, so often we think of, you know, Paul as being the, the great theologian of the New Testament, and he certainly is, but perhaps in a way that we think of Acts as all sort of mission-focused, 
maybe to some degree theologically vacuous. And as I was working through that, I, I hmm. don't get that sense. Right. It's chocked full of theology that right. drives mm -hmm. the Christian life. Mm -hmm. And and sort of a thesis that I got as I was working through it is, is of course, it's Pentecost focused. But uh, as as others have rightly noted, it's it's Christ-centered, it's Christ-focused. These are about the things that Luke writes to Theophilus, that Christ continues to do and teach. And I felt that there was a sense in which um, Acts is very visionary. There's various visions that take place in the case of um, Stephen, who we can talk about beholding the ascended Christ, uh, Paul, and, and trying to connect the dots between the way in which these uh, foundational figures have a, a glorious vision of the exalted Christ. We could say maybe almost um, in what I, I think maybe what's going on in Acts, if we think about the, um, uh, the beatific vision, mm. maybe there's something already to the already of that as we await the not yet. Uh, Christ is unfolded to the church through Acts, uh, certain figures seeing him, and then he is uh, he is presented to the church who, in various ways, hears and sees him through the apostolic word that is preached. And so, um, yeah, kind of a thesis I put together, as the church beholds the resurrected, ascended Christ by the proclamation of the apostolic word, it is empowered to bear witness to Christ, even unto death placing the world on trial while the church itself is tried by this world. And mm. the last part we particularly see in Paul's life towards the end. Yeah, clearly. Yeah, you definitely see a lot of those themes of, of suffering unto glory. But uh, yeah, that's the thing that, that you brought out time and time again in the sermons. But as we read through the book of Acts, it definitely comes to bear that the church is bearing witness to the resurrected Christ. Yes. And I, the first thing I think of, of course, is... is Peter's sermon right there in Acts chapter 2, where he's declaring that God has made him both Lord and Christ, but then carrying that message on to the whole world, uh, the known world throughout the rest of the book, and then everything, you know, all the, the, the Gentiles' response and the Jews' response to that message. Yes. So they go to bear witness, and God calls them to bear witness, and they're, in, you know, in many places and in many times they are called to to suffer on behalf of that so it's their union with Christ their identity with Christ mm. which causes their suffering but that's part of the larger plan and scheme for how Christ is building his church and how we come to be conformed to his image yes and prayerfully that when he returns you know we will be made like him when we see for we shall see him as he is first John 3 2 so yeah I I hadn't thought too much about that uh, in specifics. So hearing yes. that each and every Sunday, as uh, I get to sit in the pews with my family, uh, it was it was beneficial and good for my soul. Because of course I've developed and thought about some of those theological themes in other books: Colossians three one through four, Philippians two five through eleven, Philippians three, etc. Uh, Romans to some extent, especially in eight uh, six through eight. But seeing them work out in the yes. actual life of the church in history in a different genre. So it's not just an epistle. It's history. It's history. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 it's something. It's really special. And it's theologically shaped and informed history. And we can say that not just because some human author was imposing their will on it, but because the divine <laughs> right. author, the, the, the Calvinistic God of the scriptures, if I can speak anachronistically, uh, is the shaper of history mm -hmm. and of theology as well. Amen. No, that's really good. So let's talk more about this call uh, to kingdom witness bearing. Uh, how does that come forth in the book of Acts? Uh, how is this, how do we know this is a main theme? Right. So it appears at the beginning, you know, we, we have um, the disciples there, you know, Christ is, is, is with them for those 40 days and, um, and he's teaching concerning the kingdom. And of course, their question is, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Mm. And he answers them in a way which both, you know, is somewhat of a rebuke, but it's not altogether a, a denial of their interest in the kingdom because 
the book of Acts is going to be about the kingdom, and the kingdom is going to be advancing in the book of Acts, but not the way they, uh, not the way they think. Um, and so uh, he tells them, of course, Acts 1a, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what's fascinating is that uh, focus on the kingdom at the beginning. It's kind of like an inclusio, a mm. kingdom inclusio that's there in chapter 1, and then it's there in, in chapter 28. Uh, the theme of the kingdom we return to, and we get a much <laughs> clearer sense of how the kingdom is going to come as we find Paul yeah. in prison, in Rome, in Acts 28, and and, and we, we read there uh, verses 30 and 31, Paul lived there two whole years at his own experience, expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And so um, that's the way the kingdom is, is going to come through apostolic witness uh, of the church not just to the resurrected Christ, but to the ascended Christ, to the mm -hmm. enthroned Christ. Mm -hmm. So we have in Peter's witness early on, not only references to the uh, resurrection, but to the enthronement of Christ at God's right hand as king. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It makes all the difference. Mm. Uh, they're, they're not bearing the message of a king or a figure that who, who is now dead. Yes. but actually a living king who reigns and rules and who will come again. It changes everything. So speak more about that, especially as we turn start to move into chapter two. Uh, there's it's kind of a big event that happens in chapter two. Yes. Uh, how do you, how do you describe <laughs> that? What's the significance of Pentecost? Yeah, it's um, you know as as figures like you know Dick Gavin has helped us to see it is a monumentous event. It is uh, an event really which is in the Historia Salutis, uh, mm. not the Ordo Salutis. Mm -hmm. uh, there are repeated applications of Pentecost yep. uh, across history, but it is a once for all unrepeatable event as uh, the ascended Christ receives the Spirit as, uh, as the royal recipient of, of life. And as he dispenses the Spirit, as he pours out the Spirit upon his church, and and one of the things that caught my attention, uh, particularly thinking about that, I don't want to just sort of go over uh, so much as what has already been said about Pentecost. Again, the visionary aspects that we see from the beginning. So um, if you look in Acts 2.32, you know, Jesus says this, or excuse me, uh, Peter says this, this Jesus God raised up. Um, of that we are witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit or the promised Holy Spirit. He has poured out this uh, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. That's, that's fascinating. There is a oracular and an oral aspect to what's going on. And, and you know, if you're familiar with other aspects, you know, you have that oracular and oral uh, sort of thing going on in the book of Revelation. And the same language is used uh, over uh, two chapters over in chapter 4. There are Peter and John in Acts 4, 19 and 20 answered uh, the Jewish officials, who of course want them to shut up. Uh, <laughs> they say, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot speak of what, uh, cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Now, a little different verb there used for seeing, orao or idon, rather than blepo in the in the earlier one, but still, you know, cognate verbs. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense in which uh, at, at Pentecost, the church was seeing and hearing things. Now they were seeing the flames of fire, of course, but 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 perhaps they're they're you know getting a glimpse of even more of the the ascended Christ by the presence of his spirit poured out. And then what they have seen and heard is not just what they saw of Christ on his earthly, in his earthly ministry. Now they've seen and heard him mm -hmm. at Pentecost, mm -hmm. and they cannot but speak of him. Yeah. I mean, it's really tremendous uh, to see that and uh, to recognize uh, this true presence of Jesus and also experiencing it 
And how does that fit in then with the witnessing? Because that's, I mean, sometimes we might pass over that. Like it, it, the word witness is that people are testifying to something that they have seen and heard, something they've experienced. Absolutely. And so I get uh, the, the sense that I got as, as working through this, uh, working through Acts, is that um, what, what is seen and heard in distinctive ways, perhaps we want to talk about the visions that are had throughout the book of Acts, Paul's Damascus Road vision of Christ, is, is mediated to the church through the apostolic word that took place in that period, but continues now as well. And as, as Christ is, is preached, um, the church, there's a sense in which as they hear, they see, and they are empowered to yield their lives up, to serve, to uh, maybe not in every case be a, a, a martyr witness in the sense that they actually die, but that could be the case. But as they behold Christ by faith in, through the preached word, they are empowered to yield up their lives. Um, there's a sense in which that hearing and seeing dimension comes out in a negative sense at the end of the book of Acts, where Paul, uh, quoting, uh, from, um, quoting from Isaiah, uh, said to the Jews there uh, in Rome, um, uh, Paul made one statement, The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. With their eyes, they can barely hear. And their eyes, uh, excuse me, with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand mm -hmm. with their heart. And I would heal them. That's that's fascinating. It's Paul's reflecting on that uh, quotation from Isaiah 6. Where Isaiah has a vision, he's brought up into the heavenly throne room, beholding, well, uh, our brother Lane would probably say the the incoronated Christ, <laughs> the mm -hmm. pre-incarnate, incoronated heavenly Christ, and then, uh, you know, he he says these words with regard to hearing and seeing that Paul then echoes as he has beheld the incarnate, ascended Christ. That's kind of in a negative sense, the theme in, in which hearing and, and seeing is is carried out. Um, there's also a sense in which um, uh, that's that's repeated as as Paul stands before Herod Agrippa in Acts chapter twenty six. Oh, let me just read from from I believe for verse sixteen. Yeah. Rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. This is Christ, Paul. Uh, speaking about what happened to him on the road to Damascus, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things which you have s uh, in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes, so that they may turn from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, darkness to light, as people. As they're they are turned from darkness to light, they're turned from Satan to Christ. He's the bright light who Paul sees on the road to Damascus, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are being sanctified by faith in me. And the last place uh, that Paul, we see this notion of uh, seeing and hearing language is as he reports, uh, recounts the words of Ananias to a very stirred up crowd of Jews in Jerusalem in Acts. 22, uh, 22, 12 and following, he says this, the God of our fathers, this is Ananias, he's reporting the words of Ananias um, to the crowd, the God of our fathers appointed you, Paul, to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth, for you will be a witness for him uh, to everyone of what you have seen and heard. So again, this Continual seeing and hearing, hearing and seeing, back and forth. It's the more I've worked through it, it's still it's, it, it kind of strikes me as amazing. And I think there's something very significant. By the way, we won't have time to go into it, but as Christ sees the righteous one, mm -hmm. there's a lot of the doctrine of justification in him seeing 
the justified one, the righteous one in his resurrection. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Who are two of the main figures here? We always we obviously think a lot about Paul because yes. come chapter 9, he's the major figure and he's going to carry that on through the book. And then he wrote a tremendous amount of the New Testament. But what does the book of Acts present as uh, the main figures in this discipleship motif model? Right. And to the heart of that discipleship motif, I think we see principally two figures. If there were time, maybe we could talk about Peter as well. But uh, put my finger particularly on Stephen, the trial of Stephen uh, in Acts chapter 7, and the trial of Paul, uh, which is the really the latter half of the book. Um, think about Stephen for a moment. Uh, there's, uh, there's a fascinating sense in which both Stephen and Paul— uh, experience, uh, replicate the life experience of Christ. Uh, false mm -hmm. charges yeah. of blasphemy are made against Stephen, Acts 6, 11. Uh, he must stand before the Sanhedrin where more false witness are brought before him, Acts 6, 12, and 13. And then uh, Acts 6, 15, gazing at him, all who sat at the council saw his face was like the face of an angel. Right. That's very... Interesting and strange. Uh, what exactly did that mean? They saw that his his face was angelic. Um, there's a sense in which uh, you don't get a, you don't fully get maybe what's going on until you get to the end mm. of chapter seven. But as he is then put on trial, uh, there's a turning of the tables, mm -hmm. and you see this going on in Paul's life too. And it's really struck me this this trial motif. As they put him on trial, he puts them on trial. He brings what we uh, might saw, uh, say a covenant lawsuit against them. He begins with the, the Jews' rejection of God in the time of the patriarchs, reflecting upon uh, what the brothers did to Joseph. And, and then um, he spends the bulk of his time speaking about Moses, uh, spends a lot of time talking <laughs> right. about Moses. And he makes the point in, in verse 37 of Acts 7, this is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Now, Jesus is that prophet like Moses, par excellence, that the Jews are yeah. to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead they murder, uh, they betray and murder him. And so we're told at the end of uh, Acts 7, um, uh, what we're told at the end, I think, is critical to understand the, the mode of discipleship, what discipleship looks like, and also how one is empowered to be a disciple. And that's this. And again, this is not replicated in the believer's life in, a, uh, in the same way that it would be for Stephen, but there's something of the truth of it carried over in the believer's life, I believe. When they heard these things, uh, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound good. <laughs> but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, skipping down to verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens open uh, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Now, Actually, now here's the skip down to verse 59. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You know, very much like, like yeah. Christ's own words. Right. Uh, and falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he, had fall, he fell asleep. Very similar to what Jesus says on the cross. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a replication motif going on, but now there's a trailblazer mm -hmm. who's who's blazed the, the way Archegon. into heaven. Yes. <laughs> and so it, uh, there's really, in the case of Stephen, I think there's a sense in which, um, I mentioned this already, we, we talk about the application uh, of redemption, there being an, an, an already and a, and a not yet. And... Um, if there's a sense in which there's the, um, uh, if in every sense uh, there's an already and the not yet to redemption, if we're to behold Christ at the end, there's a sense in which there's a beholding of Christ at the beginning, Stephen gazing up, the heavens are open, and he sees him, and as Christ is standing there, and again, to, to refer to Dr. Gaffin, he's written very well on this motif of Christ standing before God, not sitting, standing at the right mm -hmm. hand of God. As Christ bears witness, uh, 
concerning his church to the Father in heaven, the church is empowered to bear witness uh, here, yielding up their life in similar fashion as Stephen falls asleep, to mm -hmm. put it very poetically. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how many of our listeners have really thought about some of those parallels uh, between Stephen's life and Christ himself. So how can we say then Stephen is, is really a model of Christian discipleship? What could we learn about this in terms of how our lives ought to reflect this? This isn't just merely an isolated example, but as you present it, truly a model. Obviously, yeah. it's not replicatable in the exact same way. Uh, we live in you know different times, and we're not all called to be stoned to death. But Nevertheless, uh, there's something to Stephen's life that, sh that should be a model for other Christians. Right. Yeah, this is the sense in which we're all called to be, you know, martyr witnesses, though not in the perhaps strict sense of that. But in, in the broad strokes, I think what we're seeing set on display is the Christian life. It is, um, it is you know, along the lines of how John would put it in Revelation 12, it is... Um, being faithful unto death. It is um, the church as it has its eyes fixed on Christ. I'm, you know, I'm thinking of the song, you know, be thou my vision, mm -hmm. you know, that the church is transformed as it beholds Christ by faith, by hearing into his image. I'm not saying our, our faces are going to become a, uh, recognizably angelic like Stevens were, but something of the glory of God mm -hmm. is going to transform us so that we are, are made like Steve, well, like Christ. And then in the case of disciples, Stephen and Paul filled with the glory of God so that we lay down our lives in obedience. It, it may just be an obedient service in the church. Uh, it may be in your local church, getting your eyes off of yourself and focusing on others, ser serving within the church, however, whatever that may look like. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to be said there. How, how do we find similar themes in, in Paul? Uh, how do we see this same pattern worked out in his life? Yeah. Notably in Acts. Right. So what's, what's interesting about Paul is Stephen presents us with this picture, uh, micro cosmically, if I can put it that way. And in Paul, we have the macrocosmic expanded mm -hmm. picture. It's the same picture, but it takes place much uh, longer, Paul, uh, over a longer period. Uh, Paul, I think we, we see him uh, beginning to put the, the Jews on trial by his preaching as he simultaneously is um, you know, taken hold of by, uh, by them, beginning in Acts chapter 13. Uh, he calls them to faith and repentance in the resurrected, ascended Christ. And then in chapter 14, uh, Paul has a, a sort of death and resurrection experience. Sure. It, it, you know, there's debate in Acts of whether he actually died and rose again or whether it appeared that he died. It, it is certainly the case that mm -hmm. he uh, he appeared to, to be dead. Mm -hmm. They thought he was dead. And right. then he he got up. Um, so there's a, there's very much a, a death and resurrection like experience of being stoned, just like Stephen. Yeah. You see something, I don't want to take us off course, but the, you also see that with John to an effect in the revelation. Yes. Because it, when Christ appears, he falls down, he basically dies and then Christ raises him up again. That's true. Brother. Yeah. So we That's see this glorious. in mul multiple places. That's, mm -hmm. That's well worth noting. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it, can't, it stands in continuity with that of Stephen, as yeah. Stephen experienced, uh, um, is 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 witnessing to Christ in chapter seven, um, and I think if we, uh, I think well, that happens in in chapter fourteen, and then immediately, Paul understands. I believe Paul understands that experience to be uh, prophetically. Um, paradigmatic of the Christian life. So he says uh, immediately after that, that uh, he was strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Well, he just put on display the kind of tribulations that we might endure. That's the modality of Christian discipleship, what we see in Paul's life. Now, in Acts chapter 17, 
uh, there's a there's a switch because as he is going back and forth with the Jews uh, in 17, the Gentile audience has been in view, but I would say in, in more so and in a different way, it's brought into view in chapter 17. Uh, particularly, I believe, and, and I would defer to our brother Lane Tipton, mm -hmm. who has made the point that in Acts 17, with respect to Paul's apologetic, we see a, a covenant lawsuit being mm -hmm. brought out. Yep. Stephen was doing that with respect to the Jews because right. they were part of the old covenant. But Paul does it with respect to the Gentiles uh, because they are in the Adamic covenant. Yeah, He even makes reference to Adam. In verse 26 of chapter 17, he says that uh, they all descend from one man. Well, I wonder who that is. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Paul is aware of that. Um, and then uh, in chapter 20, when he stands before the Ephesian elders, it becomes clear that Paul has been divinely ordained to go to Jerusalem and to function in a uniquely redemptive historical way to recapitulate the life of Jesus Christ uh, mm -hmm. as a disciple. And that, I, that recalls a lot of the language of the Gospels you've brought up before, to my yes. recollection. Yes. Was Jesus set his face like flint? There came a point in time in his earthly ministry where it was time for him to go to Jerusalem. Absolutely. And he was, you know, on it like a missile. Right. And, and, so yeah, let me, let me hit a few of those parallels. That's Absolutely. the first one. So in in Luke uh, nine fifty one, Jesus's faith face again same same human author Luke here is set toward Jerusalem, and in Acts twenty twenty two, Paul is uh, I think the ESV says constrained by the Spirit, but the mm. language there is the True. same as Agabus when he uh, tie, uh, bind him with the belt. He is bound mm. by the Spirit. He is bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Paul is bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. Both are begged by their disciples not to do this. Mm -hmm. um, both have an intimate meeting with their disciples, and, uh, and they speak of betrayals to come. Of course, Jesus addresses Judas. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, speaks about Wolves, who are even <laughs> would say, among among the the group gathered, um, it's a scary scene. Both are abandoned at the end. You know, um, there's Paul writes to uh, later uh, to Timothy. You know how you know every almost pretty much everyone has abandoned me. Um, both are put on trials by the Jews and then by the Roman uh, potentates, and then noteworthy uh, noteworthily is the cry of the Jewish crowd in, in Acts 21, 36. Away with him. Away with him. Now, we've heard that before as well in, in the Gospel of Luke, particularly uh, Luke 23, 18. They all cried out together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas. And that intensifies uh, in chapter 22. There the, the crowds raised their voice and said, concerning Paul, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. <laughs> now, I want to say this to those listening. Uh, that's stunning. Yeah. But if you want to be accepted by the world, uh, Christianity is not the place for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because in the end, that's the verdict that the world pronounces on the disciple. Mm -hmm. They pronounce it on Christ. You know, and here to to Christ's disciple, you know, away with such a fellow from the earth. Now, that will take place, and ironically, uh, you know, he will he will be lifted up from the earth. Paul will mm -hmm. to be with his Savior in heaven. So they think this will be a bad thing, and 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 uh, but ultimately, you know, he will he will be with his Lord in in heaven mm -hmm. and await bodily resurrection. Uh, but the the verdict is the same. You must be expelled from the earth, uh, and that's exactly well. It's not exactly shown to us at the very end, but that's what we're anticipating towards the end of Acts. Certainly. So, if there was an Acts twenty nine, <laughs> uh, 
I'm going to, I'm going to get you all wound up here in a sec. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push an atom button right now. Atom bomb of a different kind. So is Acts 29 going to be a theonomic manifesto? Uh, right, right. <laughs> Transformationalist conquering kingdom. I mean, really it's a, it's a serious question, sure. even though I ask it uh, humorously, but what, what ought we to expect, you know? Right. What's the future for the church? Is it a future of, of suffering and rejection right. by the world or a golden age yeah. prior to the return of Christ, right? The ending of Acts, there, there, there can't be an Acts 29. Um, the ending of Acts is the proper ending. And I think that's yeah. so many people think, oh, what this Luke messed up, you know? <laughs> This, it ends, you know, in, in a state of tension. It's like if music, right. you know, typically yeah. at the end of a song, you want needs, to bring needs resolution. needs a rewrite. Someone needs to punch it up. You're like, yeah. You're yeah. Like, send this to the script doctor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Pam could comment on this more than yeah. me. But, you know, musically, you typically it want to end resolve. the composition yeah. in, in a resolution. Yeah. Uh, it, there's a sense in which- It's acts, be like ending on the seventh chord. That's right. <laughs> like, it ends it no a, on an unresolved <laughs> note. Paul remains, and, and, right. and, and that's that's the proper ending. Luke is directing us to, I think, the eschatology of the disciple, you know, of the church, um, that it is to be like unto his Lord. Um, yeah, the church as it as it sees and hears Christ through the proclaimed word. As it as it beholds him seated at the Father's right hand, in, in a way like Stephen, but different, is empowered to witness unto death, and joyously so. So, if we think about in the case of Paul, um, you know, at at the end, it's not that uh, he's in shame, and and there's a note of disgrace at the end. We are told that. Uh, you know, he's he's joyously bearing witness to the kingdom while in chains. And as he's awaiting eventually to go to, uh, we believe, uh, the emperor that he would stand before would be the emperor Nero, mm. uh, to be beheaded. Mm -hmm. um, that also picks up, I, su I suppose, some, some themes of Revelation. Um, that's, that's the church's life, awaiting beheading, mm -hmm. so to speak, awaiting whatever the, the, the world would throw at it, which is not nice. The world, uh, it, it's in darkness. There's a sense in which, as we spoke about before, the eyes need to be opened because the world is enthralled to, to Satan yeah, and wants nothing more than for the seed of the woman to die. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we see at the end of the book of Acts in Paul's life. Yeah. It's certainly the the theme there of Revelation as well. I'm always brought back to you know. Then the people might ask the question: Well, doesn't the Bible talk about Christians having the victory? It absolutely does, but it's not according to the world's categories or the world's. We shouldn't be measuring our progress as a church and our and our faithfulness to Christ and His kingdom using worldly metrics. Mm. You know, so. I tend to think this way. I wouldn't say this is absolute or that I would always think this way uh, in every situation, but it's a useful biblical heuristic, a rule of thumb. You know, if the world is looking upon us and saying, wow, those guys have it together. Uh, I'm not talking about this, like anecdotally people say something like this. I'm talking about this is the world, the cosmos es estimation of what the church is doing. If they're looking at us and saying, wow, they've got it together. They're amazing. They're like really developing quite the influential institution. They're influencing the world. They seem to be big and powerful. They're even, you know, moving nations and politicians. <laughs> they're movers and, and shakers. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's like this This is like, you know, like Davos or something. Yeah. <laughs> I would say, oh, if the if the world is saying that about the church, then we're on a completely incorrect field. Like we are not doing things correctly. We are not doing what Christ wanted us to do because the success that the church has is practically, if not entirely, imperceptible to the world because they're they're blind. 
Absolutely. They're blind to the spiritual change and blind to the advancement of the kingdom, which starts off as something tiny like a mustard seed and then grows into something that takes over a whole garden, you know, something that it's almost inconceivable how something so large could come from something nearly imperceptible. Hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it's my little uh, sideways plug for amillennialism. Um, but, you know, there's there's certainly, in my in my opinion, the biblical ethic and the biblical promise of what we have to look forward to is a life of suffering, yes. but a life of suffering that is suffering unto glory. Yes. And so we do have the victory. We do yes. experience the victory even now because we live in resurrection power. But that doesn't mean necessarily that, you know, I'm, we're going to turn Chicago into a Christian city. Right. Right. Well, to, to think of it another way, you know, What's the chief end of man? Man's chief mm -hmm. end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The, the, what takes priority in the Christian faith is worship. Mm -hmm. And the book of Acts, I think, shows us in a sense the greatest way which the church can worship the Lord is being faithful, even faithful unto death, even mm -hmm. faithful to a world which will ultimately seek to to put it to death yeah and it glorifies god in doing that and so i think you know as paul is there joyously proclaiming the kingdom it's 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 there's a similar thought being expressed that was set forth uh forth earlier in um in acts in acts chapter five uh where uh you know uh the 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 uh persecuted church is rejoicing that it mm -hmm. is counted worthy mm -hmm. to suffer for the name mm -hmm. it's glorious it's not i, I think i'm trying to Hashem. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> the, the, whose name yeah christ's name um and to fill out what you were saying that's victory yeah that's not disgrace it's not defeat suffering for the name and being counted worthy to suffer mm -hmm. for the name is glory Right. And to bring it back to the beginning, we're talking about bearing witness to the resurrected and ascended Christ, the one who was crucified for sinners. That's how the power of the kingdom goes forth. It's yes. through the power of the word. Amen. And so even proclaiming that word, which is foolishness to men, but it's the wisdom of God, uh, and then living that out, a life of, of you know, obedience— which is often a life of suffering unto death, mm. whether that's death at the hands of men or just death at the hands of a sinful world uh, and its consequences because of the curse and the fall and all that sort of thing. You know, we need to to, to paraphrase a pagan movie uh, that we both uh, appreciate to some degree. Uh, we ought to be searching for a beautiful death. Yes. But, and that's where the glory is, but it's a death in Christ. It's a death to self, and a death to this world, and then a, a, a resurrection life unto Christ in his kingdom. Amen. And and we don't have to end it here, but this mm -hmm. may wrap it up. Um, back to this theme in Acts of cross and spirit or death and resurrection. There's a wonderful way in which I, I think we see the, the movement from the Gospels to Acts, uh, from Luke— um, to the writer of the gospel, to the book of Acts, and that in the gospels, uh, Jesus embraced the cross so that he might gain the Spirit. But in the book of Acts, we begin with the gifting of the Spirit mm -hmm. and what it moves inexorably toward in the life of Stephen, and particularly in the life of Paul, is the embracing of the cross. Mm -hmm. So it's the reversal. Christ embraces the cross that he might gain the Spirit. The church is gifted the Spirit that she might embrace the cross. I, I don't know if that's helpful or pithy yeah, or what have you. It but absolutely it's, is. It's helped me as I've thought about it. No, I think that's most useful. That's those, that's the ethic. That's the Christian ethic. The pilgrim ethic that we're not ultimately citizens here, but also the greater um, life calling that we have as Christ's people. So are you are you with Christ? Are you united to him? Well, if we are, then we should expect to share in a life like his. Yes. And the, you know, have this mind among yourselves or which is yours in Christ Jesus.
uh, and we need to consider ourselves as not as significant as those around us, to give up of ourselves, to be servants, uh, but also understand that we ought to suffer unto death and, and give forsake this world uh, in order to gain the kingdom. And to use another verse, uh, for the glory set before him. Amen. You know, he willingly went to the cross. Absolutely. Despising the shame. And uh, therefore uh, received a name that is above every name uh, and received that inheritance. So this is wonderful. I, I hope people will go back and read Acts again, uh, you know, soon, even if it doesn't come up in your Bible reading plan or whatever you're doing. Uh, take a look at it and read it as a whole, even as, yeah, uh, as much as you can. Yeah, sit down in two settings and read the whole thing and Absolutely. think about these themes. And with these themes in mind, I think uh, many things will be opened up to you even further. I think it'll have even greater significance. Wow, this is really wonderful. Thanks so much for coming on over today, Adam. It's really great to have you here. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate it. Head on over to the various places. Uh, head on over to Pamela York. Uh, dot com was it dot com or dot org? I should I should have checked. I think dot it's dot com. Yes, Pamela York dot com for information on uh, Adam's wife Pam, and all of her music and forthcoming music from the Affinity Trio. We, we can't thank Pam enough for use of her recordings for our uh, most all of our podcast. You know, intros and outros. Very thankful to that. She's happy and, for it. Yeah, it's awesome. And and uh, we're looking forward to to hearing some more music in the future course we're online at reformedforum.org where you'll find information about all of our podcasts courses which are available there and on youtube entirely for free upcoming events other publications uh, that are available and will be soon so if you got any questions send us a note mail at reformedforum.org but until we hear from you or see you somewhere at some point in time i do want to thank everybody for listening and watching and we hope you join us again next time on christ the center